Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. Welcome to the Fly With Us podcast. This podcast is bringing the art of conversation, self-love, mental health care and protection, life lessons, love lessons, and everything in between. Today, we're going to talk about are we predispositioned to forgiveness? I'm Lady Bounce. I am Kryptonite. All, All right. right. So they say to err is human, to forgive is divine. But I am it? a divine human. All right. Yeah. All right. All right. <laughs> okay. So um, for today, we're going to talk about the uh, the uh, headlining case. I'm going to say this right. The, what's her name? Amy Amy. Gre- Amber Geiger. Amber Geiger. I'm calling her Amy Amber right. Geiger. <laughs> it's, it's all and I'm just going to mess up the gentleman's name. So Bottom I, Jean. Ba- okay. So I'm not <laughs> even going to do that. I apologize, my brother. R.I.P. Okay. So for our mindful minute, um, the topic is from division into community. Okay. We have all known the long loneliness and we have learned that the only solution is love and that love comes with community. Our media and politics continually draw our minds into false dichotomies, dichotomies. (laughs) Gotta learn that one (laughs) of left and right, civilized and savage, conservative and progressive, East and West and so forth. Things would be different if we imagine things in circles rather than opposing poles. Each point of view tends to fade into the others when taking to its logical conclusion. Hence, liberations and archis, yes, may be regarded as right and left, but they are not far apart on many issues. In order to have peace in society, we have to somehow make room for serious disagreement without demonizing the other. We we must open a welcoming space in our minds and hearts, which is far more difficult than seeing oneself as always having the correct point of view. This evening, you may find yourself clinging to a strident point of view, perhaps as a result of new, a news story that you read or something a friend said on social media. You probably cannot and should not let go of your personal ethics and your political beliefs, but perhaps you can hold these ideologies in suspension for the time being. Allow your mind to enter into a space of not knowing, for not having solutions, of not casting blame. Before you go to sleep this evening, enter into a space of equanimity in which you regard all people in the same light. Give yourself the freedom to not have to have the correct belief. Mm. So that um, that topic, that that mindfulness minute uh, brings us to our topic of discussion, which is the, the Amber Geiger case. We won't discuss the particulars of the case because I have just found out there are some whammies <laughs> that I didn't know about. I've not been necessarily following the case per se. Right. Excuse me. My my interest in this case or, or my uh, purpose of bringing it up was the reactions that was had after the case was over. First of all, the woman didn't get any time. No. And um, I didn't know the particulars. She really should have got some time. But that's another story. Not going there. Cause we'll be here forever. Okay. (laughs) But, but, um, the gentleman's brother that forgave her and gave her a hug. And then the judge that decided that she also needs to get in on the act and give some love to this Amber chick. Um, and and then security guard who fixed her hair did. Is that what happened? Wow. (laughs) And then the reaction of the people, um, who were in the courtroom or who were on social media that have an adverse reaction to, uh, their reaction, to this case and i and you brought up a, a point i saw a meme and the meme basically do you have it pulled up by any you don't have it pulled up never mind don't pull it up i'll okay. give i'll give the gist of the meme the gist okay. of the meme was basically why are we as black people so willing to forgive other people before we can forgive one another mm. And that's just the that's not the exact meme. That's just the gist, right? You know, so that's the cliff note. That's version. The, yeah, that's the, <laughs> the the spark note version. That's the cliff note. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's the Angie can't remember what it said for real, but that was the point <laughs> of it. 
So, you know, and then I just got to wondering because um, this was a family of this. This was an African family. This was yes. an African gentleman. His brother is African. They are from Africa. And we are African American. And there's a lot of African Americans that have an adverse reaction to right. his reaction. And it just kind of made me wonder because, you know, we as black people, I feel these are just my personal thoughts, personal opinions, people. <laughs> I feel that we come from a place of of uh, inclusiveness, all inclusiveness, mm -hmm. where we embrace life, period. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. we, we just embrace all people, all beings, all things. Because we cool. No, <laughs> we, but we are. We, you know, we, just, we are. We cool. But no, but seriously, I mean, you know, and they, those that family coming from Africa, coming from the or origins of where we once came from as descendants of Africans. You know what I mean? Right. Like how how they were like, hey, I'm opening, you know, I'm I'm gonna open my heart to forgiveness just that fast. You know? Right. Whereas as African Americans, we have been conditioned in quite a different way in dealing with America. You know what I'm saying? I'm not, right. you know, just period. How how we are treated in America period are not as quick to be as forgiving and yet even though i'm saying that even though i'm saying that there have been situations where we have been quick to forgive and i'm just going to throw out because this is what pops up is the paula dean situation yeah you know where you know most right. black folks love paula dean you know oh, yeah. cook she cook with butter she can cook <laughs> she can cook with butter great cook you know what i'm saying but we forgave those little indiscretions and we accepted her you know right she apologized and she you know uh, and, we didn't and, cancel her right and are we i mean in our is that us? Are we also quick to forgive other nationalities, other races? And then we can, but we condemn ourselves all the time. We are always condemning one another as black people. And it doesn't matter how good we, we make it. It doesn't matter how right. good, you know what I mean? Like there are people going in on Tyler Perry right now. I'm so Lord Jesus, that man got a studio. Right. And he's got it on. He has it on, on land. Where the Confederate war was fought. He's right. got 12 studios on land where the, where the war for our freedom. Right. Was so fought. It, it is definitely, you know, historic. But then on the flip side, um, I'm conflicted about Tyler Perry. I'm very proud of him and happy he has a studio, but he got that studio built on the negative buffoonery stereotypes. <sighs> That we fall into. I know. Here's the thing. <laughs> Here's the thing. Because it Tyler, nothing Tyler Perry does as far as his work has really been negative. Like, no, honestly. I mean, no, I'm not going to say not necessarily negative, but just that the Listen, stereotype Listen, we just going to talk about the whole Medea thing. Well, yeah. Is that what we talking about well, specifically? Medea... And and the different characters that came out of Medea, like the Uncle Joe, and even some of like his storylines that have come like from the Medea movies, like Diary of a Mad Black Woman. It was a great movie. But then there's some parts when I look at the movie and go, Ain't nobody doing that. Like No, this cause just cause you wouldn't do it don't mean ain't right. nobody doing it. That is that is that's very one. true. I guess and that's even, what it is. Cause I'd be like, I'm 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 not doing that. But and then it, but, I and can then, do bad all by myself. Yeah. I was like, well wait. I mean But even in the end, even in the end, that woman was forgiving. Right. Regardless, of, I mean, yeah, he did her dirty and she had her time where she was getting Yes. She was getting <laughs> blowing them bubbles. Hey. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> she had her time where vengeance was her wrath was swift. Right. And in the end, she opened her heart up and she was able to forgive him. But I think there was a point where I did feel, ah, a man in a the dress. They just trying to demasculate him and, and yeah. you know, they this and that. But the idea came from his mother. Right. You know what I'm saying? And and I, I have to say, my grandma was very Medea-esque. You know, and then he's not, and then he's he's. I mean, uh, is it really such a stereotype if you really basing it off of people that you actually know? If someone that you know really acts that way, you know what I'm saying? I mean, yeah. And then what? And is I, it? I mean, is, I don't. And then I, 
I'm also like I, I struggle too with like the um I love the theme of his movies that love conquers all. I don't like the theme that says black women have to be saved by a man and that we have no we have not necessarily value that's not the right word but like we have if a man doesn't come save us then we're just like over here destitute waiting to be saved like i don't need nobody to save me i I got this i don't see i don't see his movie saying that how do we get on Tyler Perry movies? Okay, wait talking a minute. About him, but I anyway, did. But, but listen, I, uh, to, to just to, we gonna we gonna get off Tyler Perry right after I say this. But <laughs> I don't see I don't see his movies as saying that a man has to come save you. I see his movies as saying there is always someone out there that will see your true worth and that will okay. value your true worth, and you don't have to settle for someone that doesn't value you as a person, as a woman, as a queen, regardless of how much money he makes, regardless right. of what type of job he has. It's not about the material. It's not about the wealth. It's about the happiness. It's about the completeness that another person can bring to you when they see the value that you can bring to them and the completeness that you can bring to them. And Aww. that's what I get out of the relationships that I see him having going on in his movies. That's what I see. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I, can, I can see that. I can, I get that. So, in terms of, it, you know, since we're talking about entertainment, if you think about, like, the movies that we are shown, in the movies where we are persecuted and we are put down and we are treated one way or another, we always seem to come out of it with this sense of, well, we can forgive because look at where we are now. Like, we, yeah, this was bad, but I got this good job now. And the world isn't like that anymore, so I can forgive the transgressions of the people who persecuted me. And I can also be very loving and forgiving to other people who are persecuted because I know what that feels like. So having been in a situation where I'm always, you know, as black people, we're always beaten down. It's easier for us to embrace the other people that are down here with us. You know, and then and then to be like, oh, well, we forgive because the Bible says you, you know, have m- to forgive. Now that I'm thinking about all now that I'm thinking about this and I'm kind of thinking about it in, in a different way. And it's and, you know, maybe it's not so much the issue of, oh, you can't forgive her because, you know, she did this. It's really the system. Mm. You know what I'm saying? It's the system that's that that we 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 can dislike it, but we can't touch it. So we can't really. You know what I'm saying? Right. It's not it's not a solid object. It's not a materialized object where we can go to it and and persecute it and point at it and tell right. it we don't like you. As opposed to a person who may have been part of the system or a person who, mm-hmm. you know, as a result of this system is getting off on something that they have done to us. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm the, yeah, mm-hmm. I got a little deep on you right there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. So then the system has created situations where we can forgive the system and we can forgive the machine, but you wronged me and you look like me and I can't forgive. And because you wronged me, now you have to die. Now your whole existence has to be snuffed out because you have done something to wrong me and I can't fight the system. So I'm going to fight you because you're closer. And that's my, that's what I'm saying. That that's what I'm saying. That, that the issue may be, that the issue may be deeper than what maybe we even realize as opposed to being just upset with the Amber chick. It's really the system that we really have the problem with, but we can't really attack the system the way that we can attack the Amber chick. And well, with the things that you told me to have come like, we need to be attacking that chick anyway. Cause that right. and then just dead ass wrong. If you, but, <laughs> if you look at um, like high profile cases, Sabrina Fulton, Trayvon Martin's mother says she cannot, will not ever forgive George Zimmerman. She said, I don't care what the Bible says. I don't care what my, my church family tells me to do. My, my family tells me what I should do and how to heal from this. I cannot and will not ever, ever forgive him totally understand and people are not mad at her totally understand they're like yeah we get it 
totally on. I mean, because that too is a system. It, right. That too is part of the system that is oppressing us and, and killing us. Like, honestly, him not getting any time walking away from that, making money off of it. Yes. That is told that's that is the system. Yes, it is. Right. And then there's also another narrative. Okay. Okay. In this society, in this country, since since we were fl- free from slavery, f- we have always been criminalized. Everything yes. we have, every every time they have put something out there, it has always been to make people afraid of us, to put to put the thought into people's head that we can't be trusted, that we're criminals, that we're out. We're to dangerous. Hurt. Yeah, we we're dang- that has been our narrative in this country since. Eh, since the, from day one and then it's and it's like a, it's like it's like a little kid you know what i'm saying if as a child if your parent tells you you're stupid if you right. hear it enough times you'll believe that you're stupid right there won't be too much of anything anybody can tell you that's going to make you believe differently right. well my mom said i was stupid my whole life so why would I think like anything that. else? Right. And I, so yeah. the narrative about us in this country for so long has been the same thing. You all are criminals. You all are, are you, you're all trying to be white. You're all trying to be this. You're all trying to be that. You're, you're lazy. You're, you're no good. You know what I'm saying? All the negativity that has always been thrown at us. And yet, and yet another narrative about us is that we're all we're so forgiving so then let me so the the negative system that portrays us in this light we've always been criminalized we've always been all of these negative things what happens when we feed the machine oh well that's because we're in in a lot of cases you know, I've seen, you know, memes and discussions on Facebook when they say, well, the white man doesn't have to do anything to us anymore because now we're doing it to ourselves. When I'm walking down the street and I see a group of black boys, depending on how they're dressed, I might think a certain way for half a second. But that's because we've been conditioned. That's because of the narrative, right? And then we, even with that narrative, we feed into the narrative. We do. We act like, oh, and we gotta just, be thugs and, and we gotta that, do these things. We repeat that narrative to one another. I just yes. had a conversation with somebody where he was telling me, oh, um, I had a conversation with my friend and I was telling him about black on black crime and he was saying black on black crime doesn't exist. I said, that's because it doesn't. Right. So of course he go, well, why do we do so many things to each other? If black on black crime doesn't exist. I said, where did you hear that from? Where did you hear the term black on black crime? I said, have you ever heard the term white on white crime? Right. You ever heard the term Hispanic on Hispanic? Do you think if you go over to China that they say Asian on Asian crime? Mm-hmm. Like the only terminology you ever hear when it comes to some, it's always being black on black. You don't never hear anything else. Right. And white people Why, I victimize said, white people, white people said, all the look, time. I said, the fact of the matter is this. People do shit to people every day. Right. And it doesn't really matter what color your skin is. The issue is demographics. It has absolutely nothing to do with color. It's about demographics. I told him if I know that Tyrone goes to work every day at 11 o'clock from 11 to 7, I know that for eight hours his home is unoccupied and he stays down the street from me. I don't know what's going on at Tommy's house. I don't know what time I would have to case Tommy's house, which means I got to leave my house, go to his right. hood, sit down in front of his stuff and see what he do every day. And if then the t- don't get caught on me first. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now that was my other point. And take the chance that his neighborhood isn't being patrolled every 15 to 20 minutes. I know the cops ain't in my neighborhood. Right. I know they ain't riding down my street. And Tyrone lived within walking distance. And I know Tyrone got a brand new TV and a brand new Xbox. Right, because he work every day. And I, Because he work every day. And I know that I got a chance to get that TV and that Xbox because he, on, he work for eight hours. And I know when he coming and going from his crib. So I know how much time I got to get it. I know when I can get it. And it ain't far from me. So I know I can't get in and get out. And the odds of me being caught is slim to non-existent. So, um, you know, it's it's not about black on black. It's about demographics. White people do the same thing to white people, but you don't hear nobody on TV talking about white on white crime. 
Right. And I, I say that when it comes to like like the, the big thing, the big buzzword in schools now is the school to prison pipeline. Yeah, okay. gee, I touched but on that too. Here's the thing. If there are 20 black kids in a school of a thousand white kids, your suspension rate for your white kids is going to be a hundred times higher because you only got 20 black kids walking around. When you go into a school that's predominantly black and there's only five white kids in that school, you can't say that black males make up, they're being suspended at a higher rate. They make up the school. Mm -hmm. So even though the white kids are in fact being suspended, the number of them being suspended is going to be much smaller. So then we like to say stuff like, oh, we, we're predispositioning our black males to go to prison by kicking them out of school. But Oakwood got suspensions too. Oakwood yeah, is kicking kids no, out of school. You, let me tell you what the difference between Oakwood is and 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 uh, and like Dayton Public School. First of all, Oakwood got a better education system. What they doing? They got com- they got new computers. They got new books. They so got does, new shit. So it is DPS. Okay, now wait a minute. Now hold on. Nine times out of ten, when you dealing with DPS, your child if they, if if you are <laughs> if you have a child that is you know getting to nine times out of ten they have been labeled as a problem child even before they hit middle school. A lot mm-hmm. of a lot of a lot of black children have been labeled as oh he's a problem child he's a behavior right. issue he's got an attitude problem and that usually occurs between kindergarten and elementary school. So now you got a child that is being told by administration, you're a problem. Right. You've got issues. You're bad. You have bad behavior. You did. It's another tactic of preconditioning Mm -hmm. where now this child is thinking, well, I'm bad. So I might as well be bad. So I might as well. Yeah, I get well, attention when I'm bad. I get I had attention. A, um, I had a principal who put us through like a professional development and it had this quote and said, uh, there's no such thing as a bad child. And so my white coworker spoke up and I loved him for this. He said, well, if there's no bad children, there's no good children either. Because you have nothing to compare it to. Mm-hmm. So you can't say if you're saying that this is a bad child. What are you comparing it to? Mm-hmm. So if there are no bad children, then there's no good ones either. There's only children. Which is how it should be. It should only it should be, be children. And that's how... Because you might n- label this child as a bad child. This is a bad child with behavior issues. Right. But is it... Maybe it is a good child. Maybe it is a, a child that just has a learning issue. Right. And maybe the issue is that as an educator, you might need to do a little bit more, dive a little bit deeper to right. see... If this child indeed has a behavior problem or if they have a learning problem or maybe usually, it's not a learning problem at all. No. Maybe they're so smart, they're bored right. and they need to be challenged. I usually look at, at those kids that, you know, like they that are labeled bad because, of course, most of them I get to interact with personally. I usually right. say I don't say that they're bad. I say you got bad habits. Mm -hmm. you've picked up these bad habits along your years of schooling because this is what got you by this was your coping mechanism for whatever is really going on Mm -hmm. your coping mechanism is to divert to what's easiest it's always easier to do the wrong thing because to do the wrong thing you don't have to do much right so even in terms of of black people and the whole black on black crime like you said it's easier to go rob tyrone's house than it is tommy's house because I got motive. I got opportunity. I got space. I got time. I got all the things that I, I don't have over right. here inf- on this right. side. Right. But that don't mean that Tommy ain't going to get robbed by, uh, by Steven. Right. <laughs> you know, Steven and, is probably plotting on Tommy right now. And Steven is probably on mess. You know, we, you know, because stereotypes tell us these things mm-hmm. that, you know, black people are, are criminals. And then and we you're not going to hear, then, then you're not, and you're not going to hear about Steven robbing Tommy, but you'll hear about, James Robin Robin Tyrone. Right. And why You'll is that? You'll hear about that. It, it perpetuates the stereotype. It keeps it going. It keep, yeah, I worked it does. For, I worked for a TV station here in, in town and in the newsroom. Biggest day on a big banner. It says, if it bleeds, it leads. Mm. And I thought, oh my God, what a callous way to think of people. Just as stories, just that, as just, and that's just just, how just, as, a story, as a story, just as a headline, just as as ratings. But if you look at how our world works, 
it's the same thing. We're not right. people. We're savages. We're animals. Well, that's we're just like, that, we're you know, non-deserving okay, we gonna, of the good life. We're going to put it out there because, you know, it's out there anyway. Our niece being in a car accident just recently. Right. And she tweeted, well, not tweeted, I'm sorry. She talked about how people, she's in the car, she's pinned in the car, she's yelling for help. And, and people are driving by slowly with cameras, right. but nobody's attempting to help. Right. And that's where we are now. Yeah. Like that's, that's absolutely, there's a baby in the car. Right. There's a woman, a young woman asking for help, screaming for help. Right. And the best you can do is, is not to pull out your phone to call the police, but, but to, to pull out the phone to videotape and and what are you taping like right what are, are you taping if she dies like on camera like right. it's a bad accident true enough but what are, she's alive right. like it doesn't occur to you to get oh my god she's alive let's help how does that not uh, how does that not occur like how does that thought not process that right that, well and the, the same thing with with those teenagers who burned up in a car back in march you have all of these people Pulling out, going Facebook Live, not one person ran to the car to try to do anything. Now, I get it. The car is on fire. But how many other heroic videos have we seen where 20 people go when they ripping the doors off the cars, even though the car is on fire, to get out who's ever inside? You know, we've seen videos like that, too. If I came upon an accident like that, whether I knew who was in the car or not, I don't think my first instinct, I'd like to think I, you, you my might. first instinct would be to try to help or at least call mm -hmm. 911 I would, as I opposed would think, to let me record it. Right. I believe, I believe because I have been in a situation where someone has needed immediate help, immediate, immediate, not, it wasn't a car accident or anything right. like that, but it was just a situation where, of a person needed help. And I didn't have, it wasn't even a thought to not do anything. You know what I'm saying? Right. It was like, I immediately, I had this training. I know this, let me go help. Right. You know what I'm saying? And, and then even if you don't have the training, just man, what you can look I like do? You in a bad situation, right? Let what me see can I if do? I can do something that might help you. Like maybe, maybe I can open the door. Maybe I can pull you out. You know what I'm saying? I mean, and we are like, if you, it, w the whole point of us being here is to, for real, for real, be one another's keeper, help one another. Are we are my? Are, am I my brother's keeper? You know what I'm saying? That type of situation. Like we, we're supposed to help each. That's the human. That's supposed to be the humanity in us is that we can love one another unconditionally without needing a reason hmm. to do something kind. Hmm. It's just to do it because it's a, just a kind thing to do. Right. And so now we talk about. Our forgiveness self the, forgiveness yes, and self-care self self-care because if you if you're taking care of yourself then it is easier for you to take care of somebody else it does change your narrative in your mind of let me be helpful as opposed to let me record yeah, there's that and then there's also you know just being able to forgive period is it is it wrong to be so forgiving of of people of not just of ourselves or you know just right. of, of anybody you know what i mean can can you can you know is that okay like for real all right so let's get on to this forgive <laughs> someone because i could go you know i'm right. talking okay yeah, right. <laughs> Today, take the time to let someone know that you forgive her. This isn't always an easy task, but forgiving someone for hurting you is important for your mind and body. When you hold on to grudges, you carry unwanted stress and anger. If you can't say, I forgive you in person, write a letter or just say it out loud to the universe. Find your own way to let it go. You will feel it in your heart when you do. I'm going to tell you something about me real quick. <laughs> I ain't going to lie. I do. I I will forgive you, but just cause I forgive you, don't mean I forget. And I will cut you right on off. Yes, but that don't mean that I. You know what I'm saying? Right. And, and I is that. But now I gotta ask myself: Am I truly forgiving somebody if 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 I if I do that? Is that true? Is that really forgiveness? Yeah, and I'm gonna tell you why in in ten seconds. Yes, it is for forgiving the person, but it also is realizing that you've been hurt and you don't want to experience that hurt anymore that that person did to you. I can forgive you and not fool with you ever again. Because for me, self-preservation is key. Self-preservation is everything. So for the preservation of self, 
I can't allow you to hurt me like that again. And especially if you don't own up to what you did. Oh, yes. If you can't own up to what you did to me, yes, I can not forgive you, but I am out. Deuce. Deuce. So we talked about forgiveness. Now, let's talk about what unforgiveness does to your brain. So for our brain science, we've all been deeply hurt in some way. Betrayal by a spouse, a behind your back criticism from a friend, hateful judgment from someone at church, a false accusation by a coworker, unfair treatment by a boss or a parent. The deeper the hurt, the harder it is to forgive. But sometimes we simply don't forgive. We harbor a grudge. Resentment builds in our heart. We nurse the offense. And as a result, we remain prisoner to our pain and we harm our brain. When someone hurts us, it's normal and natural to feel the pain. God created our brains to help us survive when we feel threatened. It's called our fight, flight, or freeze response. It is generated in our emotional centers, primarily meditated by two almond-shaped clusters of brain cells called your amygdala, which we talk about a lot. When they are activated, a series of biochemical processes begin. Your adrenal glands that lie on top of your kidneys release the stress hormone cortisol into our bodies, and the brain releases neurotransmitters into the brain. Those, in turn, activate part of our nervous system called the symphatic nervous system when the system is activated among other things our attention gets highly focused on survival our digestive system stops working our pupils dilate our saliva glands slow our blood pressure and our heart rate increases and our muscles are ready for action our body prepares itself to fight flight or freeze so unforgiveness can keep our bodies and brains in the state of high alertness and it leads to unhealthy results such as rumination we nurse and rehearse the hurt which reinforces our negative emotions and burns the event and pain even deeper into our neural pathways when we're not focused on the task our inner self-talk will often default to rehearsing that painful situation Diminished memory. When we remain stressed for long periods of time, when we refuse to forgive, the cortisol our brain releases causes it to build and it doesn't release. And it builds up in your hippocampus, which is bad for you. Amplified negative emotions. Prolonged stress also amplifies our amygdala sensitivity, making us even more susceptible to further hurt and pain, which means the more you're hurt, the more you dwell on it, the more you think every situation is hurtful. Even when it's not, your brain is already going there. You're already in that state. The last one, excuse me, is shade of fruit day. This concept describes the secret pleasure we feel when we see those who have hurt us experience misfortune themselves, Mm -hmm. (laughs) i.e. karma. It actually causes our brain to produce a pleasure neurotransmitter called dopamine. It actually feels good to see bad things happen to those we don't forgive. It's the opposite of praying for your enemies, which Jesus has commanded us to do. So what can you do? Four things. First, admit your pain, then get over it. Journal about your pain, process it, write it down. Then begin to choose to forgive the person or not choose to forgive them, but forgive yourself for not forgiving that person. Mm. Then draw this one, draw deeply from your religious grace. At the root of Christian faith lies grace, receiving God's grace and extending it to others who have hurt us. Mm. Well, all right. So the biggest person that you always need to forgive is yourself. Well, all right. Mm. <laughs> That's deep. If you, I mean, if you think about it in, in those terms. Forgiving yourself makes it easier to forgive other people. Yeah, well, I suppose. (laughs) I mean, I ain't never really been mad at myself like that. (laughs) And you know why? I ain't never been so mad at myself that I couldn't forgive me. (laughs) But but do you know why that is? Because you you fly. I'm a yes. But I'm gonna take that back. Yes, I have. I have been that mad at myself. I have. I'm gonna take that back. I have. There has been one occasion where I have been that mad at myself that I have not been able to forgive myself about something. Yep. So, so, and it's only been one. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, one, it's, that's, it's not bad. Consider I suppose. If, if you think of how much life you've lived, one time ain't nothing. 
<laughs> but because you fly, you first love yourself, you will eventually get to a point where you can forgive yourself for that one thing you haven't forgiven yourself for. <laughs> And for our listeners, if you have something you need to forgive yourself for, I encourage you to do it. Do it swiftly. Do it slowly if that's what makes it better. But follow us on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, and email us at flywithusla at gmail.com. We'll see you next week. I'm Lady Bounce. I'm Kryptonite. And we out.